You must finish what you started. I hope you know how to deal with this, Wake. I guess you New Yorkers are used to rough situations like this. It takes crazy to know crazy. Give me the goddamn gun! They're coming! Alan, Wake, oh God! I am your biggest fan. You missed your deadline! You think whatever it is you're gonna do is gonna make a difference? It's all in your head. A decade's passed since Alan Wake released on the Xbox 360, and I remember it pretty well. I worked at Best Buy, but I couldn't pre-order the book-shaped Collector's Edition there, so I had to go to GameStop to pick up my copy. I also bought the Special Edition Strategy Guide, which came bundled with a behind-the-scenes coffee table book called Alan Wake Illuminated. I went full-on fanboy back then for Remedy's psychological thriller, their first post-Max Payne release hauling all of that Ellen Wake paraphernalia through several moves and thousands of miles over the years, never knowing that I wouldn't get full use of it until I sat down to make this review. But what was the big deal about Alan Wake? I've said plenty about Remedy's Max Payne games, and as they wrapped up Max Payne 2 in 2003, they brainstormed what to work on next. Initially, they drew up concept art and prototyped a fantasy game, but ditch that in favor of a more down-to-earth idea about a Stephen King-esque writer vacationing in the Pacific Northwest whose nightmarish creations come to life. The game was another technical beauty for Remedy, showing off a massive, beautiful environment with dynamic, real-time lighting with a variable time of day alongside volumetric lighting and physics out the wazoo. Their tech demo featured tornadoes years before Just Cause 4. Remedy was putting together a kind of open-world survival game in which you fought the evil Taken at night while stocking up and fortifying during the day. The demo shocked and awed, and the following year, Microsoft announced that they would publish the game exclusively for Xbox 360 and PC. E3 2006 brought a new trailer, but the project went dark after that, winding up on several vaporware lists before resurfacing in 2009. Remedy simply couldn't figure out how to build a narrative around such open-ended gameplay. While Microsoft assisted the best they could, the decision ultimately came down that they needed to make a more focused and linear game that took advantage of the work they'd already done. Their massive world was carved up into levels, and the game was whittled down to scale. The brooding literary thriller released in May of 2010 exclusively for the Xbox 360, with the PC version following a few years later. Ahead of its debut, after seven years of development, Remedy commissioned a six-part web series called Bright Falls that follows a reporter in his trip to the eponymous town where strange things happen. Despite the promotional push, Alan Wake was, like Max Payne 2 before it, a bit of a flop out of the gate, selling a mere 160,000 copies in its debut month. Launching against Rockstar's Red Dead Redemption probably didn't help, but a softer-than-expected critical response and a heady concept dampened the initial mood. While releasing two DLC specials, The Signal and The Writer, Remedy rapidly prototyped an Alan Wake 2. But Microsoft was understandably put off by the concept of a big-budget sequel, and so was every other publisher Remedy shopped it to. But assets and ideas from the tech demo wound up in Remedy's next few projects. What Microsoft did eventually approve was a small standalone kinda cool called Alan Wake's American Wasteland that was more combat-oriented while extending the series' mythos. At that point, they were well into development of Quantum Break, and I've said plenty of words about that, too. Last year, Remedy reacquired the rights to Alan Wake, which reactivated rumors that they were working on a sequel. The answer is no, but this is one of those anniversaries where we recollect our feelings on the series and ponder whether we actually want an extension of it. Alan Wake eventually became a decent hit, with franchise sales pushing more than 4.5 million copies as of 2015. Of course, I imagine many of us haven't played the game since it released, because that's the kind of game it is. For me, Alan Wake was a game I really enjoyed as an experience, but not nearly as much as a game, which felt like a big step down from the people who brought us the Max Payne games. It wasn't very fun, and it took itself very seriously. But as we celebrate the game's 10th anniversary, to understand and appreciate the mystery and ambition of Alan Wake, we need to start from the beginning with a trip to Bright Falls. With Alan Wake, Remedy was not only inspired by the horrors of Stephen King, but by the format of television shows. The game is divided into six episodes, plus two DLC specials, that serve as a season of an interactive show. 
At a point, Remedy and Microsoft discussed releasing the game piecemeal, episodically, a concept still ahead of its time in 2010 and still a rare bird in 2020. Microsoft, however, was concerned that people would buy an episode and sales would fall off each subsequent episode to unacceptable levels. Considering how the game sold anyway, this seems like a lost opportunity. Microsoft was obviously being cautious with their investment in a AAA game by a prestige developer that had been in development for most of a decade. While Sony was trading in award-winning single-player experiences that Alan Mike would have slotted right in with, Microsoft's hallmark franchises were Halo and Forza, games with extensive online features and high engagement rates. Alan Wake was an odd duck. Each episode of Alan Wake has the hallmarks of a television show. They open and close with cinematic cutscenes complete with title cards, teases for the next episode, and rehashes of previous episodes. If I had to wait even a week between each of these episodes, I would have been clawing at my Xbox in impatience. At about 2 hours each, Alan Wake adds up to about 12 hours of game, and then an extra 2 hours between the two DLC specials. Now I'm going to talk about the game's graphics and presentation later, but I need to make a point here that this may be the only game I know of where the pre-rendered cutscenes are actually of a lesser quality than the in-game cinematics. Yes, the cinematics are capable of special effects, quick cuts, and other visuals that can't be done in real time. They pop up in-game randomly for fractions of a second, and they work well to ramp up the tension. However, what matters the most, what sits at the forefront of the scene, are the characters, and they are terrible looking. First off, they have a terrible visual jitter to them that isn't corrected in any way. The characters look and move like low-power mannequins. They animate stiffly, their facial animations don't keep up with the dialogue, sometimes leaving them with gaping mouths. These lands may be haunted, but this is a different horror from the uncanny valley. Alan Wake deals with themes that thoroughly take advantage of Remedy's technologies. With darkness and light, Alan must fight the shadowy taken of the night with his flashlight, flares, and flashbangs. Thomas Zane, the glowing diver that appears in Alan's dreams, is an avatar for the light while the game's antagonist consumes it, snuffing out light wherever possible. To build and maintain the game's tension, most of the game takes place at night, fast-forwarding you through daytime sequences and creating an environment that's perfectly suitable for hordes of demonic lumberjacks. You'll frequently use instruments of light within the environment to combat the darkness, and you'll find yourself spinning up and kicking plenty of old generators to create bubbles of safety as well. You'll use these islands as your checkpoints and to heal as well. Alan heals with light, which is pretty nuts, but thematically appropriate. Alan is also fully capable of swapping out the batteries of his flashlight while the flashlight is still on. It's not a bug, it's a feature. The game also deals with the theme of dreaming versus being awake, something the game's early trailers teased at. I mean, Alan Wake, A-Wake, you know? I've read plenty of fan theories about how the game is a dream beyond this point or that point, but the game treats your actions very literally. What you see is what you get. Alan wakes up several times in the game, sometimes with a shock. The game makes a few references to dream logic, but the game doesn't deal with dreams as hard as they could. Alan Wake released a few months before Christopher Nolan dream thriller Inception hit theaters. Despite having the advantage of interactivity, the game doesn't have nearly the fun or exercise nearly the level of creativity of the film in exploring dream logic. I don't remember too much about the 2006 film Silent Hill, but I do remember the ending. The mother and daughter defeat the evil whatever and leave the haunted town of Silent Hill. But even as they trace their route back to their home, they arrive to find it visually cold, juxtaposed against the warm home that the husband resides in in the real world. They are both in the same place, but obviously in different dimensions, and then the film ends. It's the most dreadful, but in a good way, part of the movie. This scene is immediately what came to mind as Alan deals with what reality is. But reality in the game is exactly as we see it. There are no surprises. And so I'm a little let down that they didn't pursue dream logic and alternate realities more thoroughly, or really, at all. The game's kinda cool American Nightmare, a fitting title, does dabble a bit with this theme, but with disappointing results, and I'll get into that later. It wouldn't be a Remedy game without some show playing on TV scattered throughout the game. Here, it's Night Springs, a take on Rod Serling's Twilight Zone. The first episode, A Quantum Suicide, wound up being the kickoff inspiration for their next big game, Quantum Break. These are far better quality than the still shots of the Max Payne games and a fun surprise when you find them. When I picked up the game in 2010, it came with a whole bunch of supplementary material. Material you wouldn't be exposed to unless you invested the extra money to buy what honestly comes across as extraneous, unnecessary purchases. I have a huge problem with how several multimedia franchises handle their canon, where you need to experience one component to fill in the expository gaps of another. One shining example is Halo 4. 
Its complex exposition-filled plot had some weird holes if you hadn't read the pair of Forerunner novels that released ahead of the game. Alan Wake, the writer, is a controversial figure and a bit of an ass, it turns out. It's not a notion you truly absorb unless you read the Alan Wake Files, the book that comes with the collector's edition, or watch Bright Falls, the web series that released in advance of the game. He gets drunk, he goes into rages, he strikes paparazzi. He's not the stoic hero that the game presents him as for the most part. The game's minor villain, FBI agent Nightingale, materializes out of nowhere and disappears just as fast. You don't learn that he's a rogue agent, or that he's investigating paranormal activity because something strange killed his partner years ago, unless you peruse the supplemental content. Before I break down the story beats of these games, I need to warn you that I'm not 100% sure that what I'm about to say is true. I'm like, 95% sure. Having played Alan Wake all the way through twice, American Nightmare through once, read the Alan Wake files, Alan Wake Illuminated, the strategy guide, and every last reliable wiki and site on the internet I could find, I only have most of my questions answered. Since the game's mythology is so open to interpretation, there are things that just aren't going to have solid answers. That said, I will do my damnedest to produce as clear a picture as possible. Episode 1. Alan Wake opens with a dream. He's driving down the road at fast speeds and hits someone who disappears. Here, Thomas Zane, a bright light, teaches you how to play the game, how to dodge, and how combat works. You're chased by figures of the dark presence to the lighthouse, a common theme in Alan Wake's dreams. Alan is awakened by his wife Alice as they take the ferry to Bright Falls. They're here in a fictional Washington state on a long-awaited vacation to help him clear the writer's block that has clouded him for the past years. He meets with the locals, including Rose, his biggest fan, and goes to the bathroom to get the keys for their cabin. He's intercepted by a mysterious woman in a veil who hands him a cabin key. He takes it with hesitation and leaves with Alice. Carl Stuckey, the guy he was supposed to meet, rushes out of the diner, cabin key in hand. Uh-oh. Their cabin sits on a tiny island, Diver's Island, out on Cauldron Lake. After kicking on the power to make sure the house is lit, for reference, his wife Alice is afraid of the dark, they settle in. She surprises him with a typewriter and he freaks out. They're supposed to be on vacation. She just wanted him to see this doctor who can help him out of his writer's block. He storms out thinking she's trying to commit him. As he departs from the cabin, she screams and he runs back to find that she's been abducted, her figure disappearing into the lake. He dives in after her. Alan wakes up in a crashed rental a week later and he decides to make his way to Carl Stuckey's gas station. He begins finding glowing pages of a manuscript that, apparently, he had written for a book called Departure. These pages are found throughout the game both in the open and in hidden corners and provide narrative for events that have occurred, ones that are ongoing, and foreshadowing what will come. Some will complain that this robs the narrative of its tension, but I think the game makes up for it by being a tense experience all around. There aren't any gameplay implications for getting all of them except for the fact that you have greater context about the narrative beyond what you're experiencing in the game. In American Nightmare, however, collecting manuscript pages allows you to unlock weaponry, and the game uses the mini-map to point out where they are. The original game offers no such help. Continuing on, Alan runs through a logging site and defeats a taken Carl Stuckey. Upon reaching the gas station, he makes a call to local law enforcement, and Sheriff Sarah Breaker arrives. She takes him back to Cauldron Lake, where he discovers that Divers Island is completely gone. Episode 2 We cut away to Alan Wake's apartment three years ago and experience a slice of the couple's life in New York. Alan is famous for his Alex Casey series of books, which were about, no surprise, a hard-boiled New York cop whose family was brutally murdered. You get to pick up a few pages from this series and they read very similarly to something out of the Max Payne games. It's a really fun throwback. The power in the apartment goes out and Alan consoles his wife in the darkness, telling her a childhood story his mom would tell him about the clicker, a little light switch that would save him from the horrors of the night. Back in Bright Falls, Sheriff Breaker wants to know what's going on and Alan gets a call from Alice's kidnapper telling him that they should meet that night at Lover's Peak and Alan needs to bring the completed manuscript. Alan obviously doesn't have it, it's strewn about the game. Alan's childhood friend and literary agent, Barry, shows up, who serves as the game's comic relief. Dr. Emil Hartman also shows up. He wrote a book about tortured creatives and runs a facility by Cauldron Lake designed to get their creative juices flowing again. This is the place that Alice wanted Alan to go to. Alan promptly slugs Dr. Hartman in the face. Barry is initially skeptical about Alan's story and they rent a cabin in the woods near Lover's Peak. Alan proceeds alone to the meeting spot but the Taken have different plans. It becomes clear to the kidnapper that Alan doesn't have the manuscript and when he manages to retrieve the kidnapper's gun, he flees into the dark giving Alan two days to produce the manuscript to get his wife back. Alan battles his way back to Barry in their cabin which is being terrorized by a conspiracy of ravens. They make it through the 
the night and begin investigating what happened. Barry gets a call from Rose, the superfan from the diner, saying she has the manuscript. Rose, however, is possessed by the failed lady who gave Alan his haunted cabin key. Episode 3. Barry and Alan arrive at Rose's trailer and she slips them a Mickey with a round of coffee. Alan awakens that night and realizes they're running out of time. He also discovers Rose's shrine to him and her two stuffed elephants, which are freaking adorable. Alan races through the park to retrieve his truck, only to find the heavy police force waiting for him at the gate. The park's manager had become suspicious of Alan and Barry spending so many hours with Rose and called the authorities. Sheriff Breaker and Agent Nightingale are there to bring him in when the agent recklessly takes a shot and Alan escapes into the woods. Alan evades capture and makes his way through the woods to the local radio station. The authorities catch up, Nightingale takes another careless shot, and Alan ducks out again. Daylight comes and Alan drives to the coal museum where the kidnapper said to meet him. Alan waits all afternoon and the kidnapper doesn't arrive, so now it's nighttime. The kidnapper calls to let him know about the new meeting point. Alan must now fight through this rustic valley, from the coal museum through a ghost town up to Cauldron Lake, to meet with the kidnapper. Before they can make contact, the kidnapper is confronted by the Dark Presence, and he admits he never actually kidnapped Alice. The Dark Presence sweeps him away in a tornado. Alan lights a flare and gets swept up as well, then subsequently tossed into the lake. Episode 4 You're saved from a drowning death by Dr. Emil Hartman, the guy Alan slugged earlier, and now he's a guest in Dr. Hartman's institution at the Cauldron Lake Lodge. So this is the halfway point where I have to stop and establish a little bit more about what's going on here. Thomas Zane was a poet, and Barbara Jagger was his lover, and they lived in the cabin on Cauldron Lake, a special place where Tom's words shaped reality. In 1970, she drowned tragically, and Tom's assistant, Emil Hartman, convinced Zane to write Barbara back into existence. This new Barbara wasn't the same person. She was now a personification of the dark presence of the lake. Tom tried to cut her heart out, but realized there was nothing inside. He wrote himself and all of his work out of existence, put on his diver suit, and pulled Barbara to the bottom of the lake. He also created a character named Alan Wake, who would come to Cauldron Lake with the clicker, the clicker Alan's mother told him about, and destroy the Dark Presence with it. In returning the Dark Presence to the Dark Place, Tom becomes the Bright Presence. Years later, Alice Wake is abducted by the Dark Presence and Barbara has Alan write Departure, the manuscript that will give Barbara incredible power. She stands by and edits his work to ensure the story goes her way. Before he can finish the manuscript, Thomas Zane arrives and rescues him, scattering his pages across the land. Alan, in a daze, commandeers their rental car and crashes it near Stucky's gas station, accounting for his lost week after Alice's abduction. The kidnapper, whose name is Mott, was employed by Hartman for less than ethical reasons and used snippets of Alice's calls to the doctor to try and get the manuscript out of Alan. Hartman recognizes that Alan has the power to shape the world with his words and wants his hands on this talent at any cost. This brings us back to Cauldron Lake Lodge where Dr. Hartman gaslights Alan into believing his wife is dead and that all of his interactions with the Dark Presence are hallucinations. Hartman wants him to write with the intent of shaping his work which will shape the reality around them. Hartman wants to take a producer role as Alan writes the end of the book. Alan doesn't take the bait and a storm arrives. The Lodge, which looks more like a loosely staffed psych ward than a retreat for challenged creatives, is soon consumed by the Dark Presence. Alan encounters Barry, who is trapped by Hartman's security, and while Barry secures their getaway car, Alan must now fight his way out, navigating a hedge maze and a horde of Taken before escaping. They make their way to the Andersons farm, who are a pair of rockers from the 70s, seeking a message about how to proceed against the Dark Presence. Alan and Barry get separated again after an avalanche of rocks crashes into their truck. Alan fights his way through the forest and they reunite in a spectacular pyrotechnic light show at the Anderson stage. They work through the farm to the house where they discover that they need to find the Lady of the Light who will have the clicker. Alan and Barry get drunk and fall asleep. Alan wakes up at the end of Agent Nightingale's pistol and they're arrested. Episode 5 Alan sees Cynthia Weaver in a vision, the Lady of the Light who warned Alan about the darkness in the back of the diner as they arrived. Breaker and Nightingale confront Barry and Alan in their cell, and Nightingale is again getting reckless, clearly drunk. Before he can do something terrible, the darkness takes him and they must now get to the decommissioned power station at the dam where Weaver lives. To do that, they have to plow through the town of Bright Falls street by street as it prepares for Deerfest to reach the helicopter at the top of the hill. We really get a glimpse of the kind of detail that the game's former open world trappings had here. They arrive at the dam and are immediately swarmed by ravens. Alan makes his way through to the generator building with a helpful chopper escort. He meets Weaver, then has to solve a puzzle to get the power shut down so they can take the pipe to the well-lit room 
at the dam to get the clicker. The chopper crashes while they make their way through the pipe, but Breaker and Barry are okay, providing cover as they fight their way to the dam. The Dark Presence doesn't like this one bit, and does everything it can to stop him. They arrive in the well-lit room, and Alan takes the clicker. Episode 6 We cut away to New York again, and Alan and his wake agree to a vacation after he decompensates during a stressful book tour. Years later, back at the well-lit room, Alan takes the clicker and proceeds to Cauldron Lake alone, by vehicle and then by foot. On the rim of the lake, Alan must defeat a whirling vortex with his flare gun. He falls into the lake again and splits in half, his mirror version becoming Mr. Scratch, the iteration of Alan Wake that will remain in the real world while he's down here in the dark place. Thomas Zane guides Alan as he summons objects into the world by training his flashlight on words floating in the air. He summons the cabin into existence and inserts his fist into Barbara's chest, flicking the clicker and annihilating the dark presence with a powerful light. Alice resurfaces on the shore of Cauldron Lake while Alan is still stuck in the dark place. It's there that he finishes the manuscript. And that concludes Alan Wake. If it had ended there, I would have been just fine with it. I'm going to be frank with you, I haven't completed the Alan Wake DLC, The Signal, and The Writer because they're honestly really freaking difficult. They took some of the weakest portions of Alan Wake as a game and built downloadable episodes around them. That said, I did manage to get the gist of it, and I'm going to be honest, they don't do a whole lot. The Signal is largely a series of combat encounters that concludes with Alan's identity splitting in half. The writer sends Alan to the lighthouse of in his dreams, and then the cabin where he reunites with his insane suffering half, and they begin work on the writing that will bring him back to reality, a new book called Return. Back in the real world, a year and a half passes, and Remedy releases the next, and until this Alan Wake DLC arrives for control later this year, the last installment of the Alan Wake series. A brief experience that can be completed in a little over three hours, American Nightmare takes place in an episode of Night Springs playing inside Barry Wheeler's Arizona hotel room. Alan comes to in the desert wasteland and must defeat his evil alter ego, Mr. Scratch a greasy-haired monstrosity and murderer who taunts Alan through televisions placed throughout the world. Alan and the characters he encounters are stuck in a time loop and you must play through a trio of desert settings three times. Each trip back in time gets shorter as characters remember the previous trip and take care of some of your workload. Several times, including the finale, you arrange and set the environment to match a manuscript. The game concludes when you exhibit Alice's film, an event that destroys Mr. Scratch and allows Alan to reunite with his wife after being lost in Dark Place for years. But dabbling in dreams and alternate realities, there's really no way to confirm that the events of American Wasteland actually happened. It's a bit of a cop-out. The game embraces and extends the story of Alan Wake to a logical conclusion like we'd expect it to, but after waiting years for a follow-up, as framed here, it doesn't matter because the game exists inside its own pocket universe within this pocket universe. It renders all of your work almost useless. The manuscripts of American Nightmare fill in some of the universe's gaps, especially the events that happen topside while Alan is stuck in the abyss, but they lack the foreshadowing elements of the manuscript in the original game. Again, this is all for nothing if it's not canon to begin with. The story of Alan Wake is the spine of what brought this game together after years of wandering development. Playing through it for the first time a decade ago, I was enthralled, but for reasons I explain a little bit later, I rushed through the latter half just to get past the game parts. The cast is solid and the episodic format is a fun way to frame this game, even if I just binge the game anyway. Do I think it should have released episodically? Yeah, I think so. I still doubt Microsoft would have had the patience to see it through to the end, but it would have theoretically given the signal and the writer more attention than they got, rather than coming across as a flimsy repackaging of assets from the base game. People may have issues with the Abrams Lindelof mystery box when it comes to storytelling, but not explaining everything, as I have here, within the confines of the game is very satisfying. If you seek out answers after a movie or a game like this, I think you win as a gamer and a creator. Alan Wake inspires that kind of narrative exploration. American Nightmare, not so much. There are a few things I'd love more than spending an hour with Sam Lake and talking about Remedy games. This fictional Pacific Northwest setting raises a few questions of its own. The last quarter of Alan Wake Illuminated is a graveyard of unused ideas and concepts. 
From particle accelerators and UFO encounters to racetracks and forest fires, Remedy was clearly throwing anything at the wall to see what would stick while lost in the development of Alan Wake. It's as if Remedy had its own dark place that it needed to write itself out of. They wanted to open big with a massive open world and all the fancy technological trappings that went along with it. Their biggest achievement was the dynamic real-time lighting that not only said the mood of the surroundings, but warned you about the oncoming terrifying darkness or the glowing approach of salvation. But Remedy struggled with how to make this work with a narrative framework, giving the player a reason to establish themselves in this world, or a compelling reason to search its vast landscape. And Remedy built a lot of landscape. They flew around the world to take tens of thousands of pictures of the Pacific Northwest for reference, and playing Alan Wake, you really just want to step out of bounds and explore. You want to explore Bright Falls or the nearby unvisited town of Watery on foot, rather than under the stress of transdimensional warfare. I remember 10, 11 years ago playing armchair game designer, wondering what could have been done differently to keep that dream alive. Buying supplies in town, meeting an ally at the trailer park nearby, forming a convoy to storm some taken stronghold, it's fun to think about. It's also hard to imagine Alan Wake with a shotgun blast of quest icons across its map, or a map, period. One of the final game's vestigial features is a floating circle in the top left corner of the interface that helpfully guides you to the next objective but provides no other information, not even a map. American Wasteland's levels are more open and combat oriented, so there's less restraint on filling it with icons. Honestly, Alan Wake could have done away with the entire interface except when it was absolutely needed. Considering all of the action takes place at night, having bright and persistent iconography and text hanging around the corners of the screen is a bit of a mood killer. They fixed this in American Wasteland. When Remedy decided to par the game down to a more linear sequence of scares, they knew they couldn't waste all the assets they'd spent years building. In crafting the story, they selected slices of the open world that they wanted to develop into levels, then finely tuned and detailed them. Even though they didn't use the rest of the world, it still fills in the background environment, teasing you about what's beyond the next hill. The game also features a number of driving sections, in which you seem to have universal access to every vehicle. You can intensify the headlights to combat the Taken, but these sections aren't great. I can't really blame the keyboard controls I used this time around, because I don't remember driving being all that fantastic a decade ago with a controller, either. They get you across vast stretches of level, and even though they're a small portion of the game, they're really an underdeveloped feature from another era. The levels themselves take incredible advantage of the world's large size. You're rarely fighting indoors through tight corridors, you're outdoors scaling up and down. It's easy to wrap your head around an objective being a real place just a valley away. It's great to look at the glowing sign on the horizon and say, I gotta end up there. There are plenty of fun sections among these levels, like the hedge maze behind the Cauldron Lake Lodge or the town of Bright Falls. Freedom. Building on the Freedom. idea Freedom. from Max Payne 2 of From crafting a little too much parents, level with dead ends to make the world feel bigger, course. Alan Wake guides you through wide tubes of forest. It's easy to get lost in areas, it's easy to get distracted and confused about where to actually go. The game uses all this extra world to hide stuff, like supply caches, hinted at with luminescent paint, but it also hides away those manuscript pages and coffee thermoses. You have plenty of use for supplies and manuscript pages, but those thermoses are really just the achievement bait. Another way that Alan Wake feels outmoded is in how he handles the environment. Alan is a clumsy figure. He animates well, but he has little interaction with the world. I'm not talking about pushing buttons or flipping switches, I'm talking about jumping over obstacles and managing ledges. There are no grip points in the environment for Alan to scale. Points where you think you would be able to climb won't let you. And then, like the good old days of Max Payne, Remedy insists you traverse narrow sections unassisted. Another fun point is the product placement, which is pretty extensive. The Wakes arrive in a Lincoln rental with a Microsoft Sync infotainment system. Verizon provides plenty of good cell reception out here, and all the batteries you pick up for your flashlight are energizers. The strategy guide offers plenty of soundtrack hits on zooms. Oh, the memories. Alan Wake, cutscenes aside, is still the gorgeous game all these years later. The volumetric lighting, including your flashlights, often serves as a weapon, and it's a remarkable complement to the world's darkness. The environments are incredible in daylight, and they have a beautiful moonlit glow at night. As you enter a hostile area, the atmosphere stirs up and the fog presses in and suddenly you know you've got to get your guard up. This is a game built for a photo mode, and it's a shame we never got to experience dynamic sunrises and sunsets. Looking out over a sea of fog shrouded pines still sends a tingle up my spine. Where light interacts with the darkness, where enemies distort and explode like lit light bulbs, are all special visual treats each time they happen. 
American Nightmare is a much smaller set of locations, and I honestly don't think its desert environments have aged as well. The game sports a brighter, more cartoonish look that feels more like New Vegas compared to the rounds and greens of Fallout 3. Considering how radical the setting is compared to the peaceful pines of the base game, it definitely feels like they were going all out with something as different as possible to differentiate itself from its predecessor. I have to give them kudos for that. I also have to give them kudos for the shortcuts they enable as you play through the game. That's something I wish I could say about Alan Wake. Soulmate. Well, you were talking about that. I was saying I don't buy it. Well, see, to me... Remedy put a big emphasis on the fact that Alan Wake is not an action hero or combat veteran. He's a writer who happens to have a gun and a flashlight. But if Alan Wake would have been an elaborate walking simulator instead of an action thriller, I would have enjoyed it a lot better. If it had just been an endless series of sprints between light sources like it sometimes becomes, it could have still been stressful, but it might have been a lot more fitting of a terrified author who wants to see his wife again. It would have also been a lot more fun. Playing Alan Wake a decade ago was not a fun experience. Yes, I enjoyed the casual, expository daylight sections and wish the game had more of them. But I hated the combat, and because the game doesn't really build tension until it's night, and your enemies don't materialize until then, it finds every last way to rob you of daylight. When Alan paces back and forth at the coal mine waiting for the kidnapper in episode 3, and the day fades to night, a wave of stress washed over me. I must have sworn at my TV, but I definitely thought, God damn it! Initially I was just frustrated because of the combat's deep flaws as a system, but in breaking down its components I wonder if the intentional psychological stress of the combat in this thriller is why I really didn't care for it. Alan Wake is no Max Payne and the game reminds you of that regularly. Alan's enemies are the Taken, humans consumed by the dark presence that exist only at night or in the dark. They're shadowy figures shifting in and out visually, and are typically lumberjacks, thugs, or whoever the dark presence could get their hands on, like a seven-foot-tall lumberjacks. Some of them are even quick on their feet, zooming around you as you try to pin them down with light. Taking down these ones is extra special. The Taken are very good with throwing axes because they usually can't hurt you unless they get within swinging range. You'll also dispatch possessed items of a variety of sizes before they're violently projected at you, putting something between you and the possessed object were ten times out of ten for me. To fight and defeat these enemies, you must first expose them to light, typically with your flashlight, and eliminate their shadowy shield. If you train your light on them, it'll gradually bring it down, but what you really want to do is focus your light to bring it down faster, something especially important when you're dealing with multiple enemies. Doing so drains your battery, so you'll need to reload them regularly. Once their shadow shield is removed, you kill them with conventional pistols, rifles, and shotguns. Since these aren't really corporeal villains, headshots don't work. Essentially, you need to kill each enemy twice, and you'll often juggle reloading your flashlight and your guns at the same time. On paper, this is a really interesting mechanic, but it gets very frustrating and even overwhelming in the game. So what's wrong with it? It's a one-two punch of your weaponry and a lack of periphery. It can be hard to manage your ammo while enemies come at you from every vector. So let me present a common example. You're running through the forest and some Taken material lies in front of you, one, two, or three of them, and you need to take them out. So you use your flashlight to knock down their shields and any need to shoot them. Now in this entire scenario, you need to stay focused on one or more of these enemies because you need to dedicate your resources to essentially killing each one of them twice. You're doing all this by backing up, not because it's a shooter, but because they're faster than you. And so you need to overpower them with some distance before they overpower you. If they close the gap and get within melee range, they can take you down quickly. The Taken have an incredible talent in flanking you. You, however, don't have a melee attack, just a dodge to save yourself for a few seconds. So you need to make sure your weaponry, whether flashlight or gun, is reloaded. So there's a huge difference between Alan Wake from other shooters. None of your weapons are magazine fed. Whether it's your revolver, bolt action rifles, or snap action shotguns, you have one, two, or six rounds available to you at a time, and each weapon must be reloaded one round at a time. All of them. So you have enemies rushing at you, and you're in a scramble to kill them once, then twice, while reloading your gun. The game throws you a bone later on by giving you more intense lanterns that allow you to cook through their shadowy shields quicker, but they're usually gone just as quickly as you get them. So while you're in this kind of tunnel vision trying to take care of those guys, enemies can materialize anywhere around you, especially from behind, and rush you from an angle that you're not paying attention to. 
Sometimes the game gives you a heads up about when this happens, but a lot of times it doesn't. And out of nowhere, and with the camera hanging right behind Alan's head, right as you're reloading your gun or flashlight, or both, you're getting a hatchet in the back or a 1-2 slash. And since you're backing up in a dark forest, it's easy to get pinned against an unseen tree or a cluster of rocks and quickly find yourself ganged up on and murdered. So how does the game work around these penalties? A couple of ways. First, Alan has that dodge, which if you can pull it off, buys you enough time to reload one or two more rounds. Then there are the area of effect light weapons. You have flares to damage opponents immediately around you. You have flashbangs that can be tossed out and serve basically the same function. And then you have the flare gun, which will destroy a field of enemies wherever it hits. These are doled out sparingly, of course, so if you're in too much trouble, you'll need to rely on environmental lighting if it's available. Sometimes the best option is to run as quickly as possible to the nearest lamplight and get the heal and the checkpoint. From time to time, however, the checkpoints don't work out quite great, especially if you're poking and prodding the environment for supplies and other crap and die before you get to a save. If you find a thermos and then die before reaching a checkpoint, you have to retrieve that thermos again and then reach the checkpoint before it'll count. Then again, I'm not sure why you'll worry about that too much except for some irrational completionism. Not that I'm innocent or anything. Also, for a guy who doesn't appear as though he'd get quickly winded, he sure does run out of stamina quickly while running. Maybe if he learned how to pace himself and jog. Both times I played this game, I was tempted to tackle it on the more difficult, normal setting, and in both cases, I was humbled after a few episodes and forced to bring it back down a notch. This forces you to start whatever section you're in, which can be a considerable amount of time. The real difference in difficulty is that your weapons damage less, so the taken become bullet and flashlight sponges. I've watched others play this game on the most difficult nightmare difficulty, and combat turns into running around like a madman, popping off shots and then running away as your stamina recharges. I'm just... I'm too old for that, guys. I'm, I was too old for that a decade ago. Hell, I was happy when the game glitched out at the Cauldron Lake Lodge being killed as I escaped because I wasn't about to try that swarm of a fight for the fifth or sixth time. So is this just a frustratingly designed combat system or an expertly designed exercise in tension building? I am absolutely signed on to the former, but in either case, Remedy understood the complaints and addressed this in American Wasteland by both giving you magazine-fed weapons that allow for quick reloads like any other shooter, but also by making ammo plentiful. Approach an ammo box and press a button and it automatically fills your entire stock, rather than forcing you to pick out ammunition for each weapon individually. You get some decent weapons to start, but as mentioned earlier, being diligent about collecting manuscript pages grants you more powerful weaponry, like Uzis and assault rifles. This gives the game permission to boost the enemy count in each engagement and have even larger enemies with dastardly weapons, but there are still moments where you can get pinned in a small area. Thankfully, you have more tools to get out of the situation. In playing through American Nightmare, I only died once early on compared to the far greater count in Alan Wake. Even with this arrangement, combat can still be a lot of work. In a game like Halo, where the enemies tend to be more bullet spongy, you'll have to defeat an elite shield and then defeat the alien itself, but you do it with the same weapon. You just have to hold the trigger down a little bit longer, but you get the job done. In the Alan Wake games, juggling two entirely different weapon systems at the same time, and dealing with enemies that are at different stages of destruction, requiring different solutions, is a juggling act and however slight, it's a mental tax, one that builds as you play through the game. That's probably why I dreaded playing Alan Wake, because it was stressful work that wasn't tied specifically to being a psychological horror experience. It was stressful work as the best compromise of being unique for the setting without handing you an armory. Since Remedy couldn't get that open world thing working, this is what they thought was the best option. I have to disagree. Alice has been kidnapped. Alan, please help me. Alice? You'll do exactly what I say if you ever want to see your wife again. I can't tell anyone except my... Experiencing Alan Wake as a cohesive package all these years later reminds me so much of all its great ideas, its incredible story, inviting lore, and memorable characters. The setting is unforgettable and the presentation sells it. It's hard to say, however, what Alan Wake could have been given even more years and even more millions of dollars to reach its peak form. After seven years of development, it's what they felt was the best product they could bring to shelves. While American Wasteland did improve things in the gameplay department, it still feels like a band-aid because it needed to improve the flaws of Alan Wake for fans while not alienating them or costing another fortune to make. Alan Wake doesn't feel like a compromise, it is a compromise, which all collaborative works are, but this feels like it was one of the hardest ones to reach. It's not hard to see why it wasn't a blockbuster seller. 
who makes a game about a novelist, who buys a game about a novelist. After reaching peak chemistry with Max Payne 2, tossing that tight action combat gameplay aside for something completely new was ballsy, and Remedy deserves props for that. We should be experimenting more, being unafraid to fail with new ideas more often. Now we all wonder about Alan Wake 2 for little reason other than it's been 10 years since the original release, and there's some Alan Wake branded DLC arriving soon for Remedy's latest action in a supernatural shooter, Control, a game I wish I had the hardware to play on. It's not as if there's actually an Alan Wake 2 in development, but in some way or another we all kinda want it. Remedy wants to make it, Microsoft's... whatever they want to do, and us Remedy and Alan Wake fans want to see the story continued. In an era where top paid creatives are resuscitating old properties and trying to extend them with mixed results, I have absolute faith in Sam Lake's abilities to write more Alan Wake. But what kind of game would that be? It'd have to play very differently. It'd have to be a different experience. It's been over eight years since American Wasteland, and Remedy would have to do something very drastic to get people really caring about the franchise again. Carving through the nostalgia of Alan Wake's journey through the night was a worthy, but still stressful journey. I certainly don't rate it any higher now than I did back then. There's a lot of potential in this franchise still, something I think Max Payne and Quantum Break have exhausted, and while it'd be easy to say we should continue the lore of Alan Wake, I think it's more fair that Remedy continue to work on doing what they do best, making something new and shiny. It may not be the first, but it is the nth review. I've been your host, Nick Marsh. I'm glad you were able to join me on this look back 10 years of Alan Wake. If you liked what you saw, don't forget those like and subscribe buttons. Those help a lot. And don't forget the conversation continues on Discord, Twitter, and Facebook. And with all that said, hey, I'll see you next time. Boo!